Anyway, that's enough about me. We're here to talk about time. We are, and I'll give you the course. There will be 12, there'll be an overview, 12 slides, then an end. So here we go for the next one. An overview, yes, that's where we're at. Look at this. We must inevitably be living with some beliefs that seem reasonable but are untrue, simply because they have not been challenged. That's by an historian of science about 20 years ago, Milton. And this is true of what I'm going to talk about tonight. People have beliefs about time, and I can tell you straight, some of them are wrong. That's it, there's just no arguing about that. And then, when you hear time at the moment, there is no science of time or anything like it, which is very peculiar when you think about it. Time is the most important thing in your life, for heaven's sake. Why is there not a single professor on earth? There are professors of every kind of nonsense under the sun now, but there's none on time, you see? There is no science of time, and I think we can make a start at doing such. And then, that's, it's a jigsaw on forum. I'll show you some bits of the jigsaw in a while. <coughs> no one has ever been able to put it together. And then people think when they're talking about time, it's all about philosophy. This is totally untrue, maybe 10% or less. There are only two things really that matter in philosophy. <laughs> Hope there are no philosophies here. One was the old debate, does time pass or are we passing through? That goes back to 500 BC. Heraclitus said you can't step in the same river twice. He thought time was like the river Corrib flowing down past us here. And we were on the current, you see. And one of the smart pupils says you can't even step in it once because you're changing even while you're in there, you see. But Zeno came along with a lot of ingenious puzzles and said, no, you've got it all wrong. We are on the banks and time is passing. We are, we are passing, time is there. And that debate has been resurrected and we'll come back to it in a later stage. Einstein resurrected that old, old debate. And I think it'd be fair to say, well over half of philosophy is concerned with that still. The rest of it, they have to speak about science. Now, science is reality. This thing here, see that chair? It's matter composed of fabric in space, certain space, but also at a certain time. Half an hour ago, it was somewhere else. And we know a lot about matter from chemistry. I was a chemist once upon a long time ago. And we know a lot about space from physics and NASA and whatnot. But look at time. I can tell you nothing. This is not my opinion. This is generally agreed. I'll tell you when. And why is there no science of time? We'll come to the reason for that in a little while. There's not a single professor of time on earth, or the last time I looked about six months ago, there wasn't one, which is very, very peculiar. And there's no institute there. Who yet, but maybe it's coming soon. I'm supposed to be the nearest thing the kids will ever meet to Dr. Who, you see. <laughs> True enough. That's the overview, so we'll start on slide one then, without any further ado. Yes, here we are. Oh yeah, this is time and biology, the limits of life. Here's St. Augustine, 395. He was the one who said, Lord, stop me sinning, but not, not just yet. You see, he was very much into time. What is time, O oh Lord? Blah, blah, blah. If somebody asked me then, I know not anymore. St. Augustine is still regarded as the first psychologist of time, the prime psychologist. He has lots of great questions about it, still unanswered. And by the way, we're still asking just what he asked. Now, when the baby is born, it has three billion seconds to live. That's if it lives to be 96. <laughs> That's uh, all of us here, if we live to 96. And all the modern babies will live to be 100 plus, barring accident. But of those three billion seconds, one billion is asleep. So you only have two billion seconds of active life, you see. And if you give yourself one thought a second, which is a bit generous, really, that means you're limited to two billion thoughts. You can work at it. that kind of order, you see. But now the lifespan, the good news is the lifespan is increasing by two years every decade. And I have been watching this for a long, long time. And they're now saying there must be a limit at 120. I have strong doubts. I don't think there will be any limit till much further up. But that's the received opinion at the minute. Uh, let's say it's about 80 at the moment. That means 100 years time, it'll be 100. It's exaggerating. So I can see 100 years from now, everyone living to 120, and quite possibly a lot more. I have been watching that very carefully for a long time. 
And the next thing is limits of biology. The speed of thought is very slow. It depends on ions, plus and minus charges, moving in and out of your nerves. And they go very slowly. It's only 100 meters a second, 200 miles an hour. The speed of thought is only one third the speed of a jumbo jet. <laughs> so if your leg could stretch from here to Dublin, someone tramped on your toe, it'd be quite a while before you realized it down in Galway, you see? The dinosaurs, one of them with a big long tail, developed a brain in their tail to uh, accommodate for the fact it was taking too long for someone from their tail to reach the head. Now, all other animals differ in their perception of time. They have different limits. Well, the fly, that's why you can't catch it. It thinks things faster because it's smaller. The brain is nearer the legs and all the rest of it. And the bat is another one. The elephant, we think it moves slow. And the snail, the poor old snail, is supposed to deal with four stimuli a second, and that's all. What should run about next? Let me see. Yeah. This is a thing I invented, what you like, the millimetre scale for the two ends of time. Up until the year 1700 or so, people believed the world was only 6,000 years old, you no, know, five and a half, and we were in the last thousand years, and the world was going to end in 2000. Newton thought something like that. And it was all very gloomy, you see. But Hutton was a Scottish geologist who was very annoyed by Kirwan, who lived up in Menlo Castle. And Hutton got down to rectify this, and he said, no pros vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. That was, the world was millions of years old. James Hutton. And he wrote a terrible book, by the way, and people had to re-edit it into a better reader before him. But this is my proposal. If you imagine my time machine with one year from one millimeter of space, and we'll say that's 10 years, it moves that much. And the time machine has to be pointed towards Australia, because that's where all the land is, southeast. And if you went back to the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago, 14 billion millimetres away, you would end up in Port Darwin in North Australia. That's how big time is. But coming forward is far more interesting. If you set your machine from North Australia going forward, you'd be over Afghanistan, well on the way home, before the sun lit up, 6,000 kilometres away. You'd be over the Crimea or something like that before the earth cooled down. Yeah, there's a lot of buts in this. But means there's a problem. Here is Stephen Hawking, you all know. Physics is the science of events. And the trouble is, it's very hard to define time. These are not my views, by the way, I'm reporting general views. Time is what a clock measures. But what's a clock? A time measuring machine. Time is what a time measuring machine measures. Oh, wait, uh, look at that. Time is distance over velocity. 60 miles at 30 miles an hour is two hours. But velocity is 30 miles per hour. It's circular. There is no definition of time as yet proper. They can't figure it out. You can look it up in the internet and see. But anyway, the top speed is the speed of light. Can't go any faster than that. And the shortest distance is the diameter of an electron. So the time for the fastest to cross the shortest must be the briefest. And this makes common sense. And it works out about 10 to the minus 23 of a second. That's a billion, billion, millionth, something like that, you see? And that's the atoms of time. Almost certainly, I believe myself, there will be atoms of time and possibly a theory built from them. Here is a very hard one. How brief is now? Richard Feynman, great atomic physicist back in the 90s even, he said, what you mean by right now is a very curious question. How brief is now? And the answer seems to be it has no length at all. Because if you take a ruler and divide the bits into plus, it's that half of the ruler, Minus the other half, there's nothing in between. There's no atom in the ruler marked zero. Uh, yeah, it's the division between. But has time any real direction at all? <laughs> there are seven things supposed to indicate time. Every single one of them has a flaw. Any scientist here, they'll think of increasing entropy. But that has to do with closed systems and people poke for them. It's not clear at all whether time is direction. All these are things on the edge of science and no one has really decided. 
there are indicators like if a thing is approach, if two things are approaching, later they will be separating. But that too is open to objections, and so on. Enough. Cassidy wrote a book on this. He's a professor of physics, I think it's Washington State. The position you hold on quantum reality is more like religion than science. Now, quantum theory works perfectly everywhere it's ever been tried. There's um, television lasers a lot, they wouldn't that. Highly operational, it works perfectly. But no one is at all sure what it means in reality. They're arguing and arguing about it. And as Cassidy said there, there are seven different views again on that. And what's supposed to happen is this, that in very small regions of time, below 10, say 10 to minus 20, you've got quantum theory. Then in bigger time, like 10 to the minus 15, you've got ordinary physics. And there's supposed to be a point at which the change over called decoherence. This is rather like a swarm of dust particles, that'll be the quantums running everywhere, all of a sudden coalesce into a ball. That one is a big butt indeed. They haven't been able to measure where it is. You can see them struggling if you look in the internet. Decoherence is better. And the Copenhagen dictum is still taught in a secondary school. Electrons orbital, most likely to be found. I think it's fair to say not many people believe that anymore. And this led to the fable of Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat was in a box with a poison vial, you see, which would be set off if an electron hit it. Or not, it wouldn't. And it's impossible to tell which. And listen to this, the cat is both alive and dead now, until you open the box. Now, that's what quantum theory uh, would have you believe. And Fred Hoyle, whom I heard a couple of times over in Scotland, wasn't it, yeah? He was Britain's greatest astronomer. He says that's nonsense because you can set off an atom, you can have an atom bomb set off by an electron or not in the middle of London. And London is both there and not there until you go and look. Bloody nonsense, you see. It was very forthright. There is a book out, and if anyone is wondering about that stuff, John Baggett, who wrote this book, Farewell to Reality, says, don't believe the multiverse, don't believe the string theory until we get some evidence. It's all too nonsensical. I don't think there's 10 to the power of 120 universe. Not at all. Now, uh, can I tell you what I mean? No, it'd be too hard. What I, yeah, yeah, my now and William's back there at the bottom is different. Our here is different from his here by 10 metres. My now is different from your now by about 10 millionth of a second. <laughs> But our senses are too slow to appreciate that. And it's still totally clear when relativity is applied to the human condition. It's called Einstein's, or just some quotes, I'll get you more in a few, little while. Einstein's unfinished revolution. The huge mismatch between physics and psychology. Time doesn't really flow at all, it's all in the mind. This is what relativity suggests. There is no objective division between events already occurred as those things and events that have not yet occurred. So we're back to the ancient Greeks. Does time pass us by or do we pass through time? That's the old Greek. And there are several analogies. One is, if you imagine yourself on a skyscraper in New York, looking down at somebody going up this street and somebody else going up this avenue, their future, you know they're going to meet, but none of them can know because they don't know. A better one is if you're a passenger on a train with your back to the engine. You'll see a telephone board abreast you, that's the present, and it fades down into the past, down the line. But the other telephone is there behind your back, only you can't see it yet. That's another analogy. And still another one is the cinema. If you're at the cinema, the present is the bit that's dancing on the screen, the past is the bit of the reel that's rolled up, and the future is the bit of the reel, it's there too, but not yet unrolled. These are all very serious, they're not my, I haven't come to my stuff at all yet. Hawking recently has changed that and said, if you imagine the film all spread out and your mind has a little light moving across it, you're moving across the thing. That's what he says. It's the same thing as the cinema. So that one is, again, up for grabs at the moment. And this is the present position on time. There are three different views. I'll just go through them very quick. Micro time is quantum time. It says one thing. Macro time is relativity, says another. Middle time is our time, says something else again. And the challenge in this, before a science of time can start, is to unite those three somehow. That's the challenge of time. 
Let me see. Having said that, how am I doing? Oh yeah, not too bad anyway. A quarter past will be finished if anyone's getting bored. Um, this is coincidence now. Look at this. Medauer was a Nobel Prize winner for skin or organ transplants and things like that. Scientists often miss things that are staring us in the face, blah, blah. It's through a belief that could not be true. This leads to the importance of anomalies. Anomalies are slight little upsets in expectation, something that shouldn't happen. And they can point to whole new territories, but they're generally ignored because everyone's going down the road and they can't be bothered with these little anomalies, you see. And then one of those is coincidence. A coincidence is a little anomaly of time. <laughs> I thought of somebody and then I saw them. It shouldn't be like that. But we'll come back to that in a minute. And that's where I have been working, or was working, and that's where I give the address at York. If anyone wants the paper, they can email me and they'll get it. And way back in Galway, many years ago, I conducted a survey of coincidence, just for curiosity. <laughs> 16 people, blah, blah, blah. Our psychology was Shakespearean. That meant common sense psychology. Nothing from the books much, because Shakespeare could say in one sentence, what a behaviourist might take a whole book to write and he wouldn't do it as well. So it was Shakespearean. And our methodology was mining prospecting. In mining prospecting, you don't neglect anything that might be a hint, because mines have been lost that way. So, uh, at the end of the thing, there were five conclusions. One of them was, the more you get interested, the more of these things you see. That happened to me lately. I got myself a Toyota Corolla, and I'm damned I was seeing Corollas for weeks and weeks afterwards where I never saw them before. You just notice them, you see? Same with coincidence. The other thing was they were clustered unevenly in time. Sometimes there'd be lots, other times for a long time, none. And we finally got that one right. It's low noise, my no mind noise state. When all was well, nothing to worry you, nothing to annoy you, nothing at all. You had time to look at these things and then you'd get more of them. They all now, this is where it came new. Every one of them involved future thought or thinking forward. First think and then see. If you think of any coincidence yourself or anyone in there, whatever, you'll see it all falls into this pattern. First you thought of somebody, then you saw them. First you thought of an ancient tune you never thought of in ages, then you hear it, and so on. Psychic means they all think there's, like telepathy, that there's a mysterious power transmitting across space. And all that has now failed, and I can tell you that because it's just going nowhere. It's staying out. But it was all simpler to interpret all these as first think and then see. Here is clairvoyance. That one came from magnetism. A mesmer back in 1780 thought there was a magnetic influence which changes it all. He had discovered hypnotism and he didn't know it. But from that he got clairvoyance, you see. And there's some stories, not many, and they all fit the first thing to see. Telepathy came from telegraphy. It was by a Dublin scientist, William Barrett, who was a professor of telegraphy up in the Royal College School of Science. And anyway, there were 109 cases eventually advanced as pure proofs of telepathy. Every dang one of them fits first think, then see. Uh, one story I remember was the foreman in Winchester Cathedral Thought he'd go home, all of a sudden he didn't want to, but he did, and he found his wife had been run down by a cab. Well, they interpreted that as she was broadcasting for help. No, he was just thinking forward, much simpler. ESP, that one came from radio. There's 186 supposed to be very good cases, 179 and fit that thing. Jung, Jung, had, uh, I'll tell you one story. <coughs> Jung was a psychoanalyst in Switzerland. He made up the word synchronicity. One of his stories was a young patient of his, they're always young women, by the way, <coughs> dreamt of three tigers and came in and told them in the morning. And he says, that's your devouring attitude, blah, blah, blah. And then she went out in the afternoon and she met three tigers, part of a circus coming past. You see, they're all first thing then.
But there's the law of Occam's razor. Occam was a Franciscan friar in the year, he died about 1349, I think. Occam is a small village south of Heathrow. He said, he went round and did a lot of good work in the Middle Ages in theology. Mysteries must not be multiplied beyond necessity. So if you have three explanations for something and just one, you must choose the one. What does explain mean? To explain is to make more clear in terms of something you already know. I can explain atoms to you as little round particles which cling together as molecules. Well, it's pretty good. It gives you some hold on them anyway. And so this one. All psychic experience, don't forget that word came from Crookes, are first think, then see. Now, as such, they're a clear opposite to memory. First see, then think, you see? So I put in these two new words, anti-memory and pre-call. Pre-call is the time opposite to recall. That diagram is missing a bit at the bottom. I'll explain it to you. That bit in the middle is now. This bit on the left is past. Those are things, interesting things that happened to you yesterday. You remember them less and less as time goes on. You recall more less about them. If it's only a stranger you pass in the street, you'd probably recall him for about 10 seconds. Then he's gone, he's not interested and so on. This suggests that once and so often, they're coming up to you as well. And that fits 98% of all the cases you see. And you can calculate the pre-call recall frequency. It's about once in 10 million. The way you get that is this, you're, alive, you're awake for 20 million seconds a year. And if you allow yourself one or two pre-calls in the year, that's 10 to the minus seven actually. Have I got that right? Yeah, but it's around 10 to the minus eight. That's the thing there. So you can carry once in 10 million, that's 10 to the minus seven of them. And this challenges the prime assumption. All the philosophy of time and all the rest of it has always assumed memory must work backwards only. Passwords are the proper word. Uh, it's so obvious no one ever thought to check. Well, I have checked, and I can tell people to check, and it's wrong, that's it. And you may as well throw away all the books that have that assumption. Never thought of it. It's assumed. There are many, many assumptions in science which have proved wrong. One was the continents are stuck there. No one ever dreamt until they checked that they're wandering around the globe. Everyone assumed you could look up and see the sun passing across the sky until Copernicus checked it and say, no, we're passing around the sun. And so with this one, that underlies all thinking on time that memory must work password only. But this graph, or diagram rather, it enables you, when you know what you're doing, to learn how to pre-call. You can predict cards, no problem. Where are we here? Roulette, yes, but it's much harder to make money. I'll explain that. It can be done. Uh, Three-digit numbers, that's a very advanced one like pre-call 568, answer 869. What do you make of that? Partly correct, so on. You can put it to electrons and it falsifies the thing that you cannot predict with the electron. Quantum, the Copenhagen theory says, uh, roulette ball you can predict if you have enough data, physical data, but electrons never, that's wrong. Easily proven now. And it closely supports Einstein's one in the real life future. And people in Britain, I always say, have you tried it yet? <laughs> no, they're afraid to try it, you see. Galileo, his proof is try it and see. Do not believe me. Galileo in, perfected the telescope, looked up at Jupiter and found it had four moons. Aristotle and the church believed Jupiter was a perfect body, no moons. So the Pope sent two delegates up from Rome all the way up to Bologna to tell Galileo he must be wrong because Aristotle said Jupiter couldn't have any moon. And Galileo set up the telescope in the courtyard and says, go out and look, try it and see. And you know what? They didn't go. They went back to Rome. They knew he was wrong. That's all science. The Royal Society has that for its motto now. Nullis in verbo. Try it and see. So when I say these things across the way, I say, have you tried it yet, Professor? No. Have you ever thought to check your prime assumption? No. no. <laughs> you tend to laugh at these people, you see? I'm on the last one here, where are we? None of these people were able to go any further. Roger. There's a terrible difference between all these marvelous theories of physics and our common impression that time is flowing past. But then Penrose says, how can we change the laws of physics? 
to uh, square with our impressions. Sure, he should be saying, how can we change our impressions? But he doesn't. Paul Davis, Einstein's, this is Einstein's unfinished revolution. The only place where relativity is uncertain of what it's about. The great riddle concerns the mismatch between psychology and time and physics. Time doesn't really flow at all. It's all in the mind, folks, but he can't say anymore. Secret of mind, solving the state. Now, this one, just come out, did I show you this a fortnight ago? This is Scientific American, is the leading science magazine. They have a full issue on time. And they all more or less agree with those things, but here's what it says. They can't see it. It says as follows, our current lack of temporal understanding, a hole at the heart of physics. That's the Sunday Times like that. It's nothing I give you. The gap between scientific and everyday understanding of time is troubling. The most straightforward conclusion is that time, past and future are fixed. And we have to explain why people got it wrong because we don't have to overturn physics. And that's the current state of time at the moment. My theory of anti-memory, this is where I should have thought of 20, 30 years ago and didn't. There are something like 15 tests of good science made up by Einstein, had a few, um, Newton and one or two, but you won't find them in any book. You've got to search, to collect them all together. And most of mine are Gelman got the Nobel Prize for um, particle physics. Medauer was a skin man. Kuhn, Kuhn is the prime historian of science. And on the right is my theory of anti-memory. Theory we'll call it. It compresses, good theories compress things into very little. Pre-call, can't get any short enough. They're elegance through brevity, short. They fit and they're balanced. Do you remember that diagram I showed you? It's nicely balanced. They're a synthesis of wide generality. They certainly are. If you can put all coincidence into that framework, <laughs> you see? They have the open-ended potential to keep doing more things with. We certainly can do that. They unify things with simplicity. That's all that telepathy and all that stuff. It's all anti-memory, that's it. They are useful through suggesting experiments unthinkable before. You can test the hypothesis. Of course you can. You can learn how to pre-call. You can predict the outcome. I can tell you now, if any young people there start to learn pre-call, they'd probably be about 70% in six weeks or so instead of 50. That kind of figure. Repeatability of such reports. Only about a dozen people have ever tried pre-call properly and they're all gone with the wind. The best one was a fellow called Frank Morgan from Atlanta. But I have a question mark on that one. We'd have to see if others repeat it. They're consistent with established science. This thing is consistent with relativity. Solves problems in there. All those quotes I give you, they never thought to check their prime assumption. And productivity, open-ended progress. Now, conclusion, and then we take questions any like. Let's see the conclusion then. The future of time. Here's Paul Davis again. He's 20 years old now. It hasn't happened yet, but now maybe it has. We're approaching a new moment in history. Our knowledge of time is about to take another great leap forward. I think this one might be it. Maybe not, but anyway. Uh, we've demystified the psychic is maybe enough for anyone. It's like electronics. George Stoney was a professor in UCG. He made up the term electron around about 1865. I've forgotten the exact date, you see. And that was the start of electronics. And 150 years later, look where that's gone, you see? And I told you, there's not a single professor of time. I'm quite sure 100 years from now, there'll be professors of three or four professors of different kinds of time, probably in, down there in college, you see? I'll be many time specialities, time in physics, time in psychology, blah, blah, blah. Meantime, it's a huge weakness on the scientific scene. That's what I'm after showing you that magazine. Whether or not anti-memory can start to fill it, I firmly believe it can. Now, if, for example, you trained six young people to pre-call and they went and proved the electron is predictable, that's the Copenhagen thing, <laughs> they would have to get a Nobel Prize, but you'd have to be properly organized to do that, you see. How can we do it now? Uh, what I would like to do is give all this over to somebody else in the next three years, three to five years. Start with a small school of time in Galway, about six people. If that all went well, that would be a year or two, two years, say, you could start the Galway Institute of Time. Remember, there's no real institute.
that, and that's new science of time. <laughs> and you can't go to the government funding for stuff like that because there's no one at all in that field. As far as I know, I'm the only one in Ireland is at that level of time, never mind the pre-call, you see? And what you need is a visionary billionaire, if any of you know any billionaires, send them up to me and we'll see what you can do about it, to support that thing, because I have done enough. And that's time, and any questions, anyone by all means, I'll answer them if I can, and I'll tell you if I can't. So is that okay? And that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul.